Good evening and welcome to Conversations Live Speaking Grief. I'm Carolyn Donaldson. Grief and loss are subjects that we tend to avoid in our society. We often regard it as a problem that needs to be fixed and it can sometimes be difficult for people to express their grief or figure out how to help those who are grieving. So how can we get better at grief? And how has this unique time of self-isolation affected our perception of loss? Tonight, we'll be answering these questions and taking your calls, adding to the discussion, we hope. And to help us do that, we have three guests that are well-versed on these topics. Let's meet our guests. Lindsay Fenton is senior producer here at WPSU, an Emmy award-winning storyteller. She's explored a wide range of issues through her work in public media. Her most recent work is Speaking Grief, a public media initiative aimed at creating a more grief-aware society. Elizabeth Brady is an associate teaching professor in Penn State's Department of Communication Arts and Sciences. She's also a public relations consultant for Penn State's global programs. After her son, Mac, died suddenly in 2012, Elizabeth began reading widely from other bereaved parents for insight, and she now regularly writes and contributes essays for websites like opentohope.com and modernloss.com that offer encouragement to the bereaved. She and her family founded the Mac Brady Memorial Soccer Fund in Mac's honor. Dr. Katie Kosartis is an assistant teaching professor in Penn State's Department of Educational Psychology, Counseling, and Special Education. She's also a licensed professional counselor in Pennsylvania. Now, over the past 15 years, Katie's worked with individuals and families grieving a variety of losses. In the state college community, she serves on numerous organizations, including Learning to Live, What's Your Story?, and that encourages individuals to share their stories of how they've learned to live with loss. You too can join tonight's conversation. Whether you're watching us on air, online through our live stream or on Facebook Live right now, or on the radio, our toll-free number is 1-800-543-8242. It'll scroll there at the bottom throughout the evening on air. And our email address, folks, is connect at WPSU.org. So Lindsay, Elizabeth, Katie, thanks all for joining us remotely tonight. Now, before we begin our conversation, we'd like to show you a preview of that Speaking Grief documentary, which airs on WPSU TV right here on air at nine o'clock tonight following this program. There's so much individual experience in this life. The one thing we are always going to have in common is that it hurts to lose the people we love. Everybody you meet is going through something. They're losing someone. Grief work is about humanity. It's about the work that we do on being more human. We have an epidemic of unspoken grief in this culture. Most people have really good intentions and they really want to support their person. The problem is that we're taught the wrong ways to be of help. If we want the kind of culture where we feel cared for inside our deepest pain, then we need to open these conversations about grief. They're really conversations about love. Let's open that conversation. But before we do so, we do want to say somewhat of a disclaimer that tonight is a conversation. It's a discussion about grief. And for that, we will not be actually going into counseling sessions about perhaps your particular sources of grief or loss, but we want to tell you that help is available. We're showing you right now some of the many, many resources that are available for help. And those numbers, those hotline numbers you see there are available 24 seven for counseling. We'll show you this graphic again throughout the evening. And we also have all of that information available on our speaking grief org website. But for now, let's start this conversation, shall we, with our, with our panel. We have to start in today's world with a look at this conversation about grief, unfortunately, becoming much more timely than ever because of everything that's been going on in this global pandemic, this post, this COVID-19 world that we live in. So we're going to start with a look at the kind of losses that we're experiencing right now. And I'm gonna ask my panel to start and 
We'll begin with, with Lindsay. Oh, there's so many losses in the time of COVID and it feels like they just keep coming. Um, I think off the bat, we had a lot of events and, and conferences and presentations planned around speaking grief that either got canceled or postponed. Um, so that's obviously something that our whole team is sort of collectively grieving. Uh, luckily, our broadcast is still rolled out on time. I'm grieving not being able to see my some of my close friends or my family who lives out of state. Um, and then, you know, more day-to-day -day losses. This in the last year, I got really into rock climbing. <laughs> That's something that I do fairly regularly at the gym for uh, physical and mental well-being. So that, you know, seems like one of those smaller griefs, but that's, uh, you know, become an integral part of my, my routine. And um, it's the big griefs to the little griefs. I'm even gr grieving as you climb, you get calluses and my calluses are all gone. So the griefs just uh, seems like we find new ones every day. Good points. Very interesting. It runs many, many, um, many emotions and, and different ways it manifests itself. Elizabeth, you're working remotely um, and, and dealing with this from a professional and personal level on so many fronts. Yeah, and I, I just want to piggyback on what Lindsay was saying and in the sense that uh, a lot of, we've seen a lot of discussion as well about how times like this can be kind of a trigger to other griefs as well. And so I think that's absolutely true because we are so um, disoriented you know, from our schedule. And so we grieve the big things like our daughter graduated from college this May and so she couldn't, you know, we couldn't have all our family together for the big celebration, you know, for the big things. Um, but also for the smaller rituals of getting together for coffee and, you know, the kinds of things that are just, you know, that make life rich with our friends and things like that. And so, and so I, I think another portion of it I was talking with my colleagues today is about the notion um, of kind of fatigue and realizing that this is not going to go away that it's we didn't just have a summer of exceptional uh, shutdowns and we're kind of getting back to normal and so i think the notion of uh, the new normal i think is really important right now and i think that absolutely happens in grief uh, whether it's a death or a loss of something that we love and so i do think this is really uh important right now to talk about for sure Mm -hmm. and, and Katie, in your professional role as a clinical psychologist, plus professionally in teaching others in this profession, you must, you must really be uh, experiencing so much, I guess, at this point. Yes, and, and I think we, we all are. And um, one of the things when Pat reached out to ask me if I was able to do this, I checked my calendar and I was actually should be on a flight right now going to Dublin, Ireland. I teach through Penn State a month-long study abroad program. So I actually should be on a flight heading there. And so that's one of the things I love to do about my job and not just personally, but also professionally, that month with students to grow and learn and um, to visit with sites, working with people with disabilities is w one of my favorite things about my job. And then I also teach a summer grief and loss class that's now going to be on Zoom. And it's a lot of, you know, we sit in a circle and we go, we have field trips, we bring in visitors and we sit with grief. And mm -hmm. how to do that online, I think, has been really challenging teaching at Penn State and this kind of loss of confidence. I'm not used to teaching this way. I like to walk around the room, move. And, and so those are some of the losses, you know, personally and professionally and trying to support everybody with death and non-death related losses right now as you're facing them yourself, you know, and that's right. that's challenging for and the, all of us. And the different ways that, that folks are having to grieve because of this mm -hmm. global pandemic. Folks, we want you to join the conversation. The toll-free number is there on your screen. You can also email us at connect.wpsu.org, 1-800-543-8242, for those who are listening on our radio right now. But we do have our first caller, and that's Janice from Huntington. Janice, please go ahead and ask your question. My question is the importance of um, having a grief counselor on site at continuing care facilities 
where there is a lot of experience of isolation, depression, and anxiety. Very good question, Janice. Who in the panel might want to address that? Uh, and maybe you can uh, clarify a little of, of, I mean, I'm biased because I'm a counselor. I think we should have counselors everywhere. And um, I think that's a huge part of what um, school districts and universities and daycares are, are trying to address is we know the impact of this mental health on in the social isolation for individuals, kids and families. And so it, there's a lot of um, individuals in our communities and schools and daycares trying to come up with plans to support not just the students, but also the families and the educators, right? As we're all experiencing a variety of losses and knowing that this has short-term and long-term implications to our mental health. And I think it's a very important point that you bring up. And I know I've been part of the conversation and, and I know many of us have here as well. I think part of this answer to Janice comes from the fact that, what was it, two years ago, Lindsay, you started looking at this documentary because you saw a, a, a void out there of even just discussing it, and now it's been, you know, elevated to such a high degree. Am I correct, Lindsay? Absolutely. When we started researching the project, almost within the first 24 hours of, of just looking at what's available, there, it was shocking how how little we talk about this, and especially in some of our more rural communities, there really wasn't much that I was able to find in terms of grief support or support groups or conversations. Um, and so that's something, again, I come to this, I'm a, fil I'm a filmmaker, I'm a film student, so I'm not speaking from any professional capacity as, as Katie is in terms of counseling, but I know just from the conversations I've had with people, even, even peer support or peer conversations, I think, can be a really beneficial tool in this. Good point. Elizabeth, um, with your personal loss, can you share with us a little more about, you know, how that happened and, and what you had and maybe the, the resources that were available and what you're, what you're sharing again by being a part of, of our initiative here? Well, I would, I would say two points. One, uh, just to piggyback on uh, Lindsay and Katie, is that uh, we do have some resources available through organizations like TIDES that are local and Learning to Live, which um, often are generated through the funeral homes and through hospitals. TIDES was actually created to support uh, children in bereavement. And so it was, it was again, someone, one person who saw the need and actually initiated it in the community. And that continues with support groups, but they're really peer-to-peer -peer support groups, uh, which I think have a really important role because uh, as a participant in the parent group, um, we sit down at times to just sit, talk about practical things like uh, how do you approach Thanksgiving with the, you know, without your child there, or how do you approach it without your spouse, you know? Mm -hmm and offer some peer-to-peer -peer support, which I think is, uh, that's the basis for a lot of groups as well. Um, as far as the professional support as well, I think that's one area that um, groups like TIDES, uh, TIDES have tried to create grief matters and some other training for counselors and other professionals uh, who are working directly with children. And so I do think, um, I do think we're at kind of a, a tipping point actually in grief on some level because uh, it there is a recognition I think that just as the the title of the documentary that to speak about grief and to acknowledge it uh, no matter the age the children and others um, but also for parents and spouses uh, that there's a level of just acknowledgement and conversation that just helps so much mm -hmm. uh, and I think um, so I think there are many different levels to it, but uh, but certainly having space to share about the people who we love who have died is the is a, a really important, and that can happen in a coffee shop, you know. Right, right. That's good. Yeah. Well, we're getting another call, and we'd like to hear now from Holly from State College. Holly, your question, please. Hi, um, I I'm Holly from Tides, actually, which Elizabeth was just speaking about. And I just wanted to thank you all um, for just doing this program and shedding light on grief um, and awareness and the impact that it has 
on so many of us, especially during these times. That's wonderful. Yeah, um, as you said, speaking griefs is, or I'm sorry, um, the tides program is available throughout the center region. And again, we have much more information about that and other programs. Thank you, Holly, for the work that you're doing. And I don't know if any of the panelists want to comment off of, uh, of their uh, in interaction with, with tides. Well, Holly, I would just ask you, I know that um, all of the meetings have had to go online and become remote. And I just wonder how, how that dynamic has worked for everyone. It has um, been working really well, especially for our adult groups right now. Um, both our um, spouse and partner loss groups and our child loss groups have been um, really getting a lot of good feedback and a lot of adults who have been joining us. Um, the kids groups have also, actually, we had tides tonight um, virtually, and I know our youngest group had um, quite a few kiddos in it um, as well this evening. So um, we're definitely getting good feedback. We typically end um, our tides when the school year ends because we typically meet out Mount Mitney Middle School. Um, but since we're meeting virtually now, um, if we want to find the silver lining in social distancing at the moment, um, we're actually going to decide to continue through the summer. We're still figuring out exactly um, what that looks like, but we're going to continue to host um, virtual support groups at least at a monthly basis um, for our, both our adults and our kids groups. Wonderful news. Thank you, Holly, for sharing that. Um, we, we do want to continue that conversation around COVID-19 and, 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 and the different dynamics that grief takes now because of it being this virtual grieving process, right? But what about those who aren't even connected to um, the electronic world that we now are engaged in, I guess? Um, that becomes a, 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 a little bit of a, a problem, am I correct? Are, are we finding ways around that? I'll just chime in fr from a personal reflection that, that this call just um, and, and thinking about things going on Zoom and going online, it made me think back to a couple of years ago at this point, when I was engaged in research around the project, I had 60 or 70 phone calls with people who, you know, were in various places of their, of their grief experience. Um, it, you know, and for me, it was to build up uh, an understanding and to make sure that what we were doing was going to be authentic to their experience. But these were pretty in depth, pretty raw at times, hour long conversations. And I, and I think one of the pieces of feedback I got most consistently at the end of those was how nice it was, even if it was an emotional call to just be given the space and the time to speak. And honestly, I didn't say very much on these calls. I would begin them very generally just, you know, can you, tell me a little about your experience. And when that space is held, even if it's over the phone, it doesn't have to be on Zoom, I think something really special happens and, and people are able to share in just that acknowledgement, that validation that another human is there and listening um, and hearing your story. And again, I don't know what to say half the time and I didn't say much, but just knowing that you're not alone in that isolation within your grief, um, I think can be, can be helpful, especially in times like this where we can't actually maybe sit in the coffee shop together. Mm -hmm. Anyone I else? Think one, I ahead. think one thing that's challenging with this is that, you know, we carve these spaces for grief. And one of the things in the community we've been doing is um, having grief at all these events, like Arts Fest that was canceled or Lion Bash. We've had booths or tables where we'd invited people to talk, write, or draw their stories of grief. And so I think that that's one thing that's been challenging is, you know, providing spaces where people aren't necessarily signing up to talk about grief, you know, and they walk by or we're showing up in different areas. And so I think that's been challenging as well. But I think, and I think the other part is people are recognizing during the pandemic so many losses that we're facing and, and previous losses, death losses and non-death losses are being activated for people in a variety of different ways. So in some sense, I've never heard people talk about 
grief and loss as much as they are now. Mm -hmm. And what an, you know, it's an invitation for us all to connect with ourselves and with other people virtually on the phone, writing and in other ways that maybe we haven't before. But I think definitely we're missing that space, holding that space in everyday areas to be able to talk about grief. Great point. And when you watch the documentary, if you haven't already seen it, again, it will air right follow, following this program at nine o'clock. You know, again, it will get into some of the supportive actions that supporters can do in just a little bit. Um, if I when, can just um, yeah, inter go ahead, uh, something that follow up on something that um, Katie said about the sort of tr triggering old and new griefs and um, us engaging this. I think one of the things around calling it speaking grief is is one of the things I've become kind of uh, conscious of is naming things as grief experiences because I and I've had a, a lot of wonderful. Um, experts working in the grief field have, have shared this, that we don't always use feeling words as, an, as adults, and we don't always even identify our own feelings as experiences of grief. Like I'll say for me, I generally sometimes have issues with anxiety anyway. And so one of my things when I'm in this state of grief with COVID is it kind of spikes my anxiety up. And I think before this project, I wouldn't have identified that as, as a grief response or a grief reaction or just feeling that extra exhaustion or feeling confused or, or any of those things that, you know, fall just beyond kind of the sad that we think of grief as being. Um, so I think just really giving yourself space that a lot of those feelings, even if you're not certain what they are, it's, could very well be part of a grief response. And it's okay, right, folks? It's okay. It's absolutely okay. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. yeah. All and right, we, we have a call and we have an email. Oh, oh, go, Elizabeth, do you mind holding that thought just one second? Because we're going to get to as many calls and emails and we invite oh, your joining the conversation. 1-800-543-8242 mm -hmm. or connect at WPSU.org. Let's go to the caller because I know they've been waiting a little bit. Jennifer from State College. Hi. Hi. My question for the panel is what happens when you have a loss but there's also an estrangement in the relationship. So it's almost a level of regret when the loss happens. Mm -hmm. Who'd like to begin that? <laughs> I, I'll, I'll start. I'm not, a, I'm not a counselor, but I, I, after Mac died, I started reading so much material. I actually had to, kind of shut down my uh, my book account for a little while. <laughs> but I do think that one thing is that, you know, relationships that we have with those that we love, as complicated as they might be, um, they, they are complicated and continue to be, right? And so I think that there is an element of, um, holding a kind of element of forgiveness for yourself, a forgiveness for the relationship. And I think there's this notion of continuing bonds, which is, I think, a really important notion that I've thought about a lot, which is um, kind of allowing that space for the forgiveness, not just the grief of the person gone, but the forgiveness of yourself uh, for a difficult relationship. Uh, and the forgiveness of them. And I do think that those are, we've taught, um, there's been, a, there was a woman, I think Paula Darcy, who did a lot of work with um, what they call ambiguous laws, which often happens with folks after like 9-11, where they were very sudden and they had no um, component, even more than sudden death, but a component of goodbye. And how to, um, how to begin to forgive and uh, search that relationship. And so I don't think it just ends with death, right? And I think it continues. Uh, and so I think a lot of forgiveness and self care is important too, you know, in holding those. I think they're complicated. And in naming that, as we've said before, with speaking grief helps. And I think just to chime in too, the permission to grieve is important too, because I think in, in situations like that, again, similar to Elizabeth being exposed to other people's experiences, is that in those types of situations, 
I think in general, because we're grief avoidant in our culture, that we tend to find ways to delegitimize or downplay not only each other's grief, but our own grief. Mm -hmm. And so in a situation like that, where maybe it, it was a, a more complicated relationship, it can be easy to internalize that and, and go to the shoulds. Like, I shouldn't feel so sad, or I don't have a right to grieve this. And just because you didn't have an ideal relationship, I you have every right to grieve that person and that relationship in the same way that anybody else does. It's all valid. Good and point. I think one thing I would add to that too is there was with, you know, disconnect in relationships, there's, Elizabeth talked a little bit about this ambiguous loss. So sometimes we, we have these losses of people that are still physically present. They haven't mm -hmm. died. So in some ways there was this grief process from this relationship that maybe wasn't there, this loss of time. And then we have a death on top of that. So I think when we talk a lot about grief and death, it's so unique for so for everyone because of all of these different, the relationship or the lack thereof, and then all of these other cultural, individual, family factors that impact how we grieve. And so it looks so differently for everybody. And you know, and there was this grief process before this death, you know, it sounds a little bit like with that. And then what it's like afterwards is, mm -hmm. is unique in and of its own. And, and so, I mean, it's great advice that you all have shared too, is having compassion for yourself and honoring all these different types of losses that have happened along the way and in, in before and after death. Good point, Katie. Conversations continues. We've got callers waiting for us, so let's get right into the next call. Judy from Johnstown, your question, please. Hi. Um, I'm dealing with um, sleep disturbances, uh, unable to go to sleep because I just review the things adding up to the death in family, and I can't get past it. Um, over and over and over again, sometimes two or three hours before I can drift off, um, one with my fiance, one with my ex-husband, one with my son, God love him, who died from a gunshot wound, and one with my grandson who died from an overdose. Mm -hmm. He was only... 18. I don't think I can ever get over them, and I don't know how to put it in a perspective that I can say this is part of my life, and this is not happening now, and go on. Judy, you're. Do you understand at all? Right. Judy, you're courageous in calling, first of all. I just want to make that point clear. Just even picking up the phone and calling with what you just described. So I, I, I applaud you personally and maybe ask the panel who, who would like to respond to, to Judy's question. Katie, do you want to start or? Sure, yeah. I do. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I mean, I say, my my heart goes out to you and um and i mimic what we just said there of of calling and reaching out and a lot of times with grief we don't we don't know what to do and um and what we can do exactly what you did is calling in and we've shared resources too if it feels like i'm not sleeping or my thoughts are running out of control there are um, a lot of supports to help in this time, but you're right. When we go through grief and loss and we lose people, um, you know, this idea of that we get to this acceptance phase of Kubler Ross is, is very outdated because we never really accept these losses. We move through life in these con continued bonds like Elizabeth was talking about. And, um, and I would say, you know, I think it's a community that we need to embrace grief it is unique in how we respond and it's exactly what you shared. It's really, cha it's really challenging and it can be really isolating. And so finding connections and supports and communities to share your stories, to hear from other people, to be witnesses is I think so important in that, 
in this grieving process. Absolutely. Go, go ahead, Elizabeth. We're about halfway through the program. I just want to let folks know, and we would like to hear from you, and then um, we'll continue. Yes, Elizabeth, go ahead. I'm sorry to shortchange you there. No, no, I was just going to, uh, again, say, you know, how much courage it takes to just pick up the call, pick up the phone and call, and I just, uh, I just, uh, I just uh, applaud you with that, because I think part of it is just starting to share that, um, you know, the complexity of those great losses. And so I think uh, just beginning to uh, speak to them is really important, you know, so. Good point. Mm -hmm. Folks, I want to let you know that if you're just joining us, I'm Carolyn Donaldson. This is Conversations Live, Speaking Grief here on WPSU. And joining us tonight, we have WPSU producer Lindsay Fenton, Penn State teaching professors Elizabeth Brady and Dr. Katie Kostoris. I think I got that right this time. Our toll-free number to call in is 1-800-543-8242. We are ready to take your calls, and also you can send questions to us at connect at wpsu.org. We want to let you know, though, this is not a counseling. We're, we're really having a discussion here ahead of our documentary, which I, I do encourage folks to stay and watch if you haven't already seen it. We'll dive into a little bit of the content of that, but we are not holding a counseling session, but we have help available. There is help available, and we want to put this up and let you know that there's 800 numbers in our community across the country, across the world of folks that can help and are there 24-7 for that. So um, depending on where you are, it's very important if you do seek and want to make that next call and you need to make that call, there is help available. We'll continue to put that graphic up and we'll have it again at the end of the program. So for right now, um, I, I do want to share with you a little bit more about the documentary, uh, again, Speaking Grief, it airs in just another half hour, and, and moving into kind of the role of the supporter of grief, of grief, those who are grieving, those who have a loss, especially in our, our, our pandemic world that we live in right now. So let's take a quick clip, uh, look at uh, another part of the documentary that, that addresses some of those questions. Most people have really good intentions and they really want to support their person. But if what you're doing is actually causing harm or distress to the person receiving it, you need to be willing to hear that. We want to match your good intentions with your outward behavior. There is definitely a call for humility because you will mess up grief work. Let's put that out there. I can't even begin to number the times that I've made mistakes. I've made mistakes in this interview around what it is to grieve and what it is to offer support. And so I think it's important to just off the bat know that you're going to mess it up. And if they are hurt by something that we say, pivot to the mistake. Don't beat yourself up around it. But understand that it's not a griever's job to course correct you then actually engage in how you can reconnect beyond the mistake. I think when you're authentic and say, I didn't mean that. I really mean to say, I, I see you're hurting. I, I don't know what to say, but I'm here for you. Those are powerful, powerful support foundations. Again, that clip from Speaking Grief that'll air in just an, under a half hour now right here on WPSU. And we want to get to, to a look at, at how to be that good support. Now, we do have a caller. I want to caution our panel, um, briefly discuss that. And then, Ivan, hang on. We want to get to your call in just a minute. But let's let's talk a little bit about that support component and how how that is a part of this discussion. We need to speak grief. We need to be there for others who are grieving. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just kick it off by saying, um, to go back to what I was, I mentioned earlier in the show, I said there's not a ton of resources out there. I do want to say there are a lot of great resources for people who are grieving, like tides that we talked about earlier. 
um, if people are able to access those. But one of the things I think that was most surprising was how little there was in terms of this question, in terms of how to be a supportive person um, for someone else in your life. And that's where we really sought with this project to sort of start to address that. And, and there's a lot more on the website, speakinggrief.org. But I, I just want to say, I think that's my favorite clip maybe of the whole documentary because it really distills what I've taken as being the key to effective support, which is just being authentic and showing up. First of all, you can't support someone if you don't show up. Um, and, and I love that expression of humility. I'm sure we could all sit here and go through stories of times that we've gotten it wrong. Um, you know, it, it's, it's not always easy, but that, um, that rooting it in the humility and in the true need to be there with your person as they integrate this new part of themselves, this, um, this new part of their journey, um, is so critical. Just that showing up and not letting the fear of failure keep you from making that step to show up. Great. Well, let, uh, go ahead, Elizabeth. I'll just, you, uh, go ahead. I'll just piggyback on that too, to say that, um, you know, our son Mac died seven and a half years ago and, and, even still, it you know I when when something happens to someone that I love or a friend or I still have a moment where I'm you know I feel inadequate to speak to it and I have to kind of realign myself and say, you know I'm we can't fix life for people we can't we all we can do for any of us is to show up and care for them and to be a presence and so you know I um you know surprise myself sometimes when I've written essays and I've read way too many books and I still have moments where I feel inadequate to address the um you know the pain in other people's lives mm -hmm. and so but then i have to remind myself that it's um you know we can't we're not there to fix it we're there to show that uh we will be with them in their journey which is really what it is is a whole new journey We'll, we'll get to more of that in just a minute. And Katie, I don't mean to shortchange you, but I've got two callers on and I want to get to as many, we want to get to as many calls. That's what this conversation is about. So Ivan from State College, you're on. Thanks for waiting. Hello. Hi, Ivan. Your question, I please? I admire your panel of uh, beautiful women. I have a question. Uh, to what degree the grief is related to social economical and social political standards in the society to what degree we need to uh, really grieve if the death happened within our society or all over the world and uh, you know uh, that's basically it. All right, Ivan. That's... Do we have a gradation of uh, grief when the grief is good or grief is, doesn't deserve to be considered as a grief? Like in mm -hmm. Yemen, millions of children dying even before <laughs> the coronavirus or somewhere else. Would you explain, um, do we have the levels of grief related to us, someone else, okay. and others? Well, thank you, uh, Ivan. I, I think we understand the panel, and I don't know who would like to take that first. So degrees of grief or levels of grief, depending on, 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 on the on the type of grief it is. I, I might, I'm, if I'm understanding Ivan correctly, I, I, think, I think that there's an interesting dynamic of specificity. And we talked about this a lot, like with language and things like that. But I, I had this quote from Wendell Berry that I was sharing with folks that I think helps understand this. And that, um, that we, um, that, we 
name and grieve for things that we love. And we have to know what we love, right? And so I think collective grief, like for an entire country or something, is is difficult to get our heads around sometimes. I think that when we grieve a specific person or someone that we love, it enables us to enter a threshold where I think we have more empathy in general for grief. And so I don't know if that's answering the question, but I've actually thought a lot about it because we we can be overwhelmed with the bad news and dangerous things and awful things that happen in the world. But until we really experience it very personally, I think it takes on something different. And I think that exact and personal element of it is what enables us to actually see more largely. But I think we grieve what we love. So I don't know if that helps, but I, I've been thinking a lot about that because I think what, what Ivan's referring to, if I understand correctly, is a kind of collective, right? A collective grief for all of the bad. Um, and I think that that is something different or maybe something, I don't know if that's making myself clear, but I, I have thought a lot about what you're saying, Ivan. Uh, and I think that Max death was intensely personal, but it passed me through to uh, have some empathy for larger griefs I, because I understood them better. So I, I think that's what I would say. I'm not sure if that helps, but yeah. Anyone else want to weigh in on that or? And I think in a little bit of what he was talking about was a higher a hierarchy of grief or this like deaths and losses and then the economic loss now. And I think that that's something that we talk a lot about in the grief work is, okay, death, and then what's the relationship with the death? And is this more important than this? Or mm -hmm. I lost someone who was, you know, a, a former boyfriend, but then somebody lost somebody who was married and a husband of this year. So my, la my loss is less important, right? Or... Yeah. is a death from COVID-19 versus, I think he was saying, children dying in other countries. I mean, there's this, there's so many different types of losses, and I think we tend to put them in a hierarchy of this is more important or this, and then what people prioritize can look really differently. Mm -hmm. What's important mm -hmm. to me may not be important to you, or this mm -hmm. loss, non-death, may be as significant as a death loss because of the secondary losses or because mm -hmm. of so many other things as a result of it. It's very, grief is very complicated. And I think mm -hmm. having these conversations about it mm -hmm. allows us to explore what's our relationship with this grief versus another grief. Mm -hmm. What's more important to me may not be as important to you. And I think at this time, there's so many different types of losses and what, what's mm -hmm. more important, right? And, and, and I think that's what converse, parts of the conversations that people are having now. And Lindsay, and I you're, think you're, you're documenting- I just wanna say, yeah, I just think one um, one doesn't cancel out the other. Like you can, you know, I love that we started the conversation sharing kind of our different losses in a preliminary meeting we had about this. Kate, um, Katie corrected me. I said, oh, my, you know, some of my smaller losses. And she said, they're not smaller, they're different. Um, that all grief is valid. It's not always the same, but I think that sort of comparative um, thinking can be difficult because I think inside all of our grief, whatever it is, we want to be heard. And it's hard to be heard if mm -hmm. you are getting that sort of hierarchy pushed at you either internally or externally that, you know, like I'm, I'm sad that I don't get to go to Dublin. You are absolutely allowed to be sad that you don't go to Dublin. And we can, I think, all come to it from a place of we understand we're in a pandemic and that there are life or death griefs happening but we don't have to do it as this comparative. Um, yeah, one is you aren't allowed to be sad about this because this is happening on a different scale. So I think just just putting out there that whatever the grief is, no matter how different it is, it's valid. Good point. Hey, with another caller, let's get to the next one. That's Luke from Cowdersport. Luke, thanks so much for holding and calling in. Your question tonight? Oh, uh, hello. Um, well, the, the last caller, as I was listening, was a man, and I, I believe was the first one of us that had called in. And uh, the, 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 the question 
is uh, and, and 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 it was revolving around you know uh, when my mother died. At this point, that's almost eight years ago. But uh, um, um, that that I think that dealing with men itself can can cause some other issues because I I remember one reflection toward me was. Uh, you know, when I, I remarked to someone about, you know, nobody seems to want to talk to me about this, and they answered back, well, it's because there are overtones of anger when you're talking about any of this. Um, yeah. And it, it's a big family, and there was even money involved and so forth. I'd taken care of my mother for several years, and she did have degrees of dementia in the final, final phases. Uh, um, but any any thoughts about challenges with grief involving men valid question and Luke thank you for for voicing that concern and your and your story or sorry for your loss um, who, who would like to begin um, go ahead Katie I don't know who, did you want to start with this one I, I think that's a great point that you bring up and when we talk about how we grieve there's so many cultural gender, society expectations about how we should or shouldn't, what's appropriate, what's not, right? And as a male, right, and angry, but if you're a female and you're not crying, are you, are you, do you not care? I think there's so many messages about what's appropriate and not appropriate or what's healthy or not healthy in grief. And, 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 and so, I, so I would say, yeah, absolutely. I think as a society, we have different expectations. And, and, and so for us to really expand and open that and to be aware of all of these different factors that impact us, right? Some people use social media to grieve. Other people think it's, you know, disrespectful or, you know, that's not an appropriate way to do it. And so there's so many different expectations of how we should and what it should look like. And, um, and so I think part of what our hope today is to really is to expand this and it can look and manifest really differently in other people. And I'm always sensitive. I don't want to speak for, for instance, my husband, who certainly talked a lot about that after our son died, that his um, that the response to mom versus dad was very different uh, for him, you know, and um and I think that's absolutely true. And I do think that there is, um, with compassionate friends and other national groups, uh, have actually started really dedicating much more directed time to talking to, to that issue, right? Uh, and talking with, um, talking specifically for with men and other things. And so, um, and so here it is, a whole panel of women, of course. Uh, but to say, um, just to say, yes, I don't think you're alone in that at all. Um, I can't speak, and I don't like to speak for my husband, but certainly I think he experienced similar things too and had to, um, you know, and had to find really uh, male friends to connect with on that level. And I think, uh, I think that's true. I would just, yeah. yeah. That's also something that came up a lot in some of the interviews we did for the project. And, and I want to, again, uh, direct the website, w, or speakinggrief.org. Uh, we have some stories up there, but there's going to be one, um, and actually one that hasn't been added yet, I don't believe, but um, a gentleman named Ron Gallagher, whose story you might connect with down the road. But I know he's very involved with Compassionate Friends and actually started a male support group because of some of those challenges, and as, as Elizabeth said, we don't want to be too general, but for people identifying as male, there are, I think, different expectations um, and different even ways of, of connecting, and they specifically started that group because of those unique challenges. And I think, like you said, Elizabeth, I think it's, for men, that happens, I've heard a lot with, especially if you lose a child, it'll be, how's your wife doing? It's similar with siblings, it'll be, how's your parents doing? Um, so I think um, there are resources and you're definitely not alone. And I also just wanted to say, you mentioned that people were uncomfortable, that you were expressing anger in your grief. And that is something that came up. And I think every conversation I had that, that anger is sort of this hidden emotion that we sideline in grief, but is actually really, really, really common. Mm -hmm. Good points. 
Folks, we are less than 10 minutes uh, to the beginning of that documentary. We have just a few minutes left to talk about in this form of Speaking Grief conversation. So we want to get to as many callers as we can. Um, again, we invite you to stay, though, and continue to watch WPSU or tune in. If you're on the radio right now, get home and tune in and check out our Speaking Grief documentary. It'll begin at 9 o'clock uh, this evening. Caroline from State College, we want to get to your call. Caroline? Hi, you are all so wonderful. I'm really enjoying this conversation. So my question is, do you think in this culture there's almost a chronic pressure to always be happy or positive? And do you think that's in part what makes it difficult for people who, who have lost someone very close to them, uh, a, family or, a family member or a friend, to be honest about how they're feeling when that grief is, is so fresh? I, after my mother died, I didn't feel like myself again for probably a year or two. I was kind of, um, I was functioning, but I was kind of in a, in a funk. And I'm, I'm just wondering if you think, uh, well, I already asked the question, if you, if you think that there's this pressure to be positive all the time and thank, thank how that you. might affect. Good point, Caroline. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, and I, we're all nodding, so I'll let whoever wants to start on that conversation. I just have to laugh because that was going to be my first comment is that I'm seeing the screen and every single one of us nodded <laughs> emphatically. Absolutely, I think there's that pressure. Um, and I just, I, I'm become very cognizant of language around grief and you described being in a funk for a year or two and I thought, well, you're not in a funk, you're in grief, you're grieving. Um, so I think, I think a massive recalibration needs to happen for how we understand grief and that it's not just this, you know, six week long process process that we're finishing. It's a journey and it's something that we integrate. Um, but without question, I think both happiness and, and productivity are things that we tend to, um, you know, idealize in this culture and, and absolutely in that sort of self re resiliency, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, that if you just you fuck up and get through anything, um, and that I think can make it really challenging as you're going through a grief experience. I, I do want to caution, we've got about five minutes left now. Please continue this, but we'll want a wrap up then with our panelists on uh, maybe some top three takeaways that our wonderful guests and audience uh, can, can leave tonight and head into the documentary armed with more information about speaking grief. But go ahead, Elizabeth and Kate, real quickly on, uh, on Caroline's question. Oh. I, I would just say, Caroline, absolutely. And I think um, I think that on some level, it took me some time to be able to kind of articulate what it was that I was, what I needed or what I was going through. And so even as we approach holidays, even now, um, you know, I will think about Mother's Day and think, okay, I need to schedule about two hours in the morning when I can sit by myself crying to my coffee cup and have my time. And then we can schedule some brunch later in the afternoon after I get myself together. But, you know, it's like an, an acknowledgement that, uh, that we carry the love of, of the people that we love with us and that it's allowing yourself to spend time in that and also to spend time in the celebration too, right? And I think that that's, that's something... Um, it is giving yourself, I think, permission to experience your own life and the fact that you miss your mother and she died. And yes, you will miss her always. And so that's some days, I think, as we move through are harder and more poignant than other days are. But I think it's a kind of ownership of that experience. Okay. And, and I, I think about an, a kind of ownership of my own life, right? in that in my in that role and so okay. it's i think it's articulating that Thank you. I, I hate to cut this conversation because it's going and we could go on forever, but we've, we've only got about three minutes left. So I'm going to ask for one good takeaway that each of our wonderful panelists can can leave our audiences with before we begin the documentary. Uh, Katie, I'm going to start with you, please. Shoot, I was hoping you'd go with somebody else. Um, <laughs> one takeaway. That's so hard. I, and you know what, though, I I would go with um, find your community and and you know have compassion for yourself and your own grief and then find others and I, i'm a counselor so i always advocate for going to counseling 
but not just that. And there's other groups, peer groups, support groups, ways to tell your story, to express yourself creatively. So there's so many things in your community to find, find others Great to point. help you grieve. Mm -hmm. Great. Elizabeth? Uh, so each morning there's a very short prayer from St. Francis that says, Lord, help me do what is mine to do. And every and that's what I say every day because it kind of empowers me on some level uh, to not be afraid to live my life. And that includes being a bereaved mom uh, as well as a mother of a vibrant young adult. And so I, I kind of... Um, I, I think about the kind of um, taking ownership and um, of our own experiences and, and to find the support. Great. And Lindsay, I'm going to ask you to be very succinct because we're going to watch yep. your, your work of art next. Yep. I think uh, I would just say the message is you are not alone. If you're grieving, you are not alone in that experience and that grief. There are communities out there. And if you are trying to support someone and you're feeling intimidated and scared, you're not alone in that ease either it's not easy for anybody but the way we get better at it is by speaking it and telling the truth about that well said great well our guests tonight thank you so much have been wpsu producer lindsey fenton penn state teaching professors elizabeth brady and katie costeros thank you so much and coming up next is that documentary speaking grief we also want to put up real quickly um, those toll-free numbers that you can call we'll have those on our website speakinggrief.org it's there we need you to continue that conversation we hope it's the beginning of a discussion in the cities around uh, in the circles around grief in your communities. We thank you so much for joining us and we th hope that you'll have a peace-filled night. We'll leave you with this graphic up and ask you to watch Speaking Grief coming up next. Thank you so much.